Hello and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate and this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get people talking. As regular listeners will know, I do love a special episode. And today I'm joined by book recommender, bibliotherapy queen and friend of the pod, Ella Bertu, who's here to help us readers figure out how to overcome life's essential problems. If you're troubled by how to cope with all the books there are to read in the world, wondering what to do when you feel stuck in a reading rut, or considering the ultimate question, if you've started a book you're not enjoying, whether or not you should finish it, then this is the show for you. We'll also be diving into Ella's latest project, Fiction Prescriptions, a pack of cards with reading recommendations to soothe your soul and offer a cure for modern life, from ageing through to boredom, via hangovers and procrastination. I began, though, by asking Ella to tell us more about her bibliotherapy work. I'm a bibliotherapist, which I've been doing for the last 15 years, and I started off doing it in 2007 with Susan Elderkin when we brought bibliotherapy to the School of Life as an idea. We did one-to-one bibliotherapy sessions there. We thought we'd invented bibliotherapy ourselves, but once we started researching, we realised that it's been going since Plato and Aristotle. People have been using the idea of bibliotherapy But in those days, it was more about theatre. Obviously, they didn't have novels then. So it was all about using art and theatre as a way of healing people. And they actually had theatres right next to hospitals because they knew that people could be healed as much by art as they could be by their medicine at that time. Is this the idea of catharsis then? Yes. Right. Yeah. So they knew and understood that by going through catharsis and going through deep emotions that were played out in front of you and that you didn't actually have to live through yourself. You could be healed and that your spirit could be reset, so to speak. So Susan and I started bibliotherapy as a one-to-one service, then under the auspices of Alain de Botton at the School of Life. And we did one-to-one sessions for the next decade and a half we after five years thought wouldn't it be a good idea to write down what we've gleaned from doing one-to-one sessions with people and just to explain a bit more about the one-to-one sessions when we do those people come to us and tell us all about what's going on in their lives currently if they have any particular issues or worries or problems or concerns and what's going on in their reading life What do they love to read? What do they hate to read? What books have they loved in childhood? What books have they loved recently? What books have they thrown across the room because they've hated? Are there any genres that they loathe or love? And then we prescribe books to help them through whatever they're going through right now or simply books that they're going to love to read. So it's a combination of being therapeutic and being a brilliant library service, you might say. People come to us for all different kinds of things, from career issues to parental issues, being about to be a parent, retiring, kids leaving home, empty nest, or deciding whether you want to have kids at all, being single, bereavement, any life issue we can help to tackle with the book. And we prescribe fiction. We're great believers in the idea of prescribing fiction rather than non-fiction because we feel that fiction can actually cure all of life's ailments if you have the right book at the right time. So one-to-one sessions, people come to us and we give them a selection of six books as a prescription and it's a tailor-made prescription to that person. We used to do them in person at the School of Life. Now we do them pretty much all on Zoom, but we also do them all over the world in New York, Singapore, Australia. So Zoom is obviously really convenient. And you collected up many of these recommendations in this book, The Novel Cure. That's actually how I first came across you through that book, which is an A to Z of literary remedies. It's one of my most turned to books. I think it's an absolute essential thing to have in any book lover's library. 
But your newest project, because it's not quite a book, is it, is called Fiction Prescriptions, published by Lawrence King. And it's almost like a series of library cards, but with a similar idea, helping people find books that address particular issues that they might be going through or experiencing in their lives. Tell us more about that. The idea is that you can look up any ailment as you can with the novel Cure. And with the novel Cure, it's an A to Z. So you can go from apathy to zestlessness with anything in between. With the fiction prescription cards, it's slightly different because it's designed to be a beautiful pack, as you say, like a library card system. And we have different topics on both sides of the cards. And one side is all different emotions like love, happiness, loneliness, ennui, excitement and the other side is life stages like birth relationships parenting and family aging dreams retirement etc so the idea is that you can look up a topic like love and then within that topic it's broken down into different sections like first love romantic love unrequited love idealized love searching for love and so you identify which topic you want to look up and then flick through the cards and find that topic. And then on that card, it will have one, two or three novels relating to that topic. I wonder if we should give people an example. What might be a good one to pull out? Let's have a quick look. Romantic love, living alone. Let's try an example. We've got fear of the unknown. Oh, that sounds like a good one. And The Cure is Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. If you suffer from a fear of the unknown, also known as xenophobia, when going into a new and previously undiscovered situation or feel intensely upset when things are unfamiliar, you need a hefty dose of Jules Verne's most famous novel. Phileas Fogg is a reclusive wealthy British gentleman who lives a very ordered life in which even his shaving water must always be brought to him at the same temperature. His butler is sacked for failing to perform this task. One day he sees an article in the Daily Telegraph claiming that it's now possible to travel around the world in only 80 days. He accepts a wager of £20,000 to attempt to prove that this is possible and ventures forth with his new French valet Passepartout. They set off for Suez, where Fogg is mistaken for a robber, and Detective Fix from Scotland Yard follows him on his adventures through Egypt, Calcutta, Hong Kong, Yokohama, San Francisco, and New York. They're thwarted in their race around the globe by a massive herd of bison, Sioux warriors, and a failing suspension bridge, but they're aided by a wind-powered sledge, a large dose of luck, and a trick of the clocks. By the time you've read this, you'll be diving headfirst into new adventures. That is the cure for fear of the unknown. Makes you want to go back and reread Around the World in 80 Days immediately. Well, I've never read it. And what's funny about that is that it does make me want to read Around the World in 80 Days. Because I feel like that's the sort of book where you thought, yeah, I know that story. Yeah. Or, you know, I watch Michael Palin. I don't need to go back to the source material. Exactly. But actually, it's like I've never read it. It sounds great. It's interesting, I thought, the format, because it is quite different from a book. Did that come from you or was it the publishers who suggested the library cards idea? It was the publishers Mm. because I think they felt it was fun to do something a bit different. Lawrence King does these really beautiful gift boxes and they've done quite a few different ideas with the boxes. So they've had one that's all about emotions, for instance. And then they've also had other ones that are like yoga poses. So they are very much aimed as a gift. It's an interesting concept and it was quite difficult to fit a novel cure like idea into a pack of cards we talked a lot about whether to use both sides of the cards or not and really we're using both sides so that we can fit more in Mm. and it was one of those things where when we first discussed it we thought it might be much shorter far fewer books but of course being me it's really hard (laughs) to just limit it to 50 books it has to be kind of 300 so that's why we got both sides of the cards it could be a book just as easily because it's got all the content of a book but then the way it works with the cards I think is really nice because you've got these different topic sections and you can kind of flick through them and you can also pull out the cards lay them all in front of you and find random ideas and books so you know just looking at them now we've got uh, world weariness fear of failure feeling unqualified to be a parent 
melancholia, wanderlust, etc. It's just another fun way, a bit like with the novel Cure, of flicking through and finding new, exciting reads. But then also, it can be a genuine aid to people who are feeling unqualified to be a parent, for instance, or being a single parent who are thinking, what could I read that might actually inspire me and help me through this stage of my life? I thought it was really nice, though, because having sort of followed you, I know that you're a great one for thinking about reading in slightly unexpected ways. I know your book, The Art of Mindful Reading, you deliberately almost took the topic of how we think about the books that we read and how we experience almost physically the books that we read. And there were lots of great suggestions like you might want to go and climb a tree and read or you might do some hula hooping and read, (laughs) which I have seen you do on Instagram. So I love this idea, actually. I thought this format was really nice. Is that important to you, giving people new ways to think about reading? Definitely, because I meet so many people, especially nowadays, who are reading less due to having other distractions in their lives, phones, computers, and so on, the internet constantly being handy. So I think people really need help with finding new ways to read. I talk to people about reading aloud together, going to interesting places to read, reading as a family, reading as a group sharing books, sending books out into the world. And as you say, that's all in The Art of Mindful Reading. And then with this pack of cards, fiction prescriptions, that's another way to find a friendly, inspiring, exciting method of getting new books into your life. And hopefully I wanted the descriptions of the books to all be fun reads in themselves. So Each one is a little taster of the book to get you rushing to your local library or independent bookshop to buy a book or borrow one or get it out on audio because I'm a big fan of audio books too. That's one of the things I love about the novel Cure is that often I'm never going to read the particular book that you're recommending, but I just so enjoy reading about the book. (laughs) Excellent. Good. That's the great pleasure. And it's interesting you say it's a continuation of the idea that you started in the Novel Cure, but what I was impressed with, knowing the Novel Cure as I do quite well, was actually how little repetition there is from books that you did in that original book. You've just got lots of fresh suggestions. And I was just thinking about your own reading life. And since you wrote the Novel Cure, you've obviously done a lot more reading. When you're reading, are you always seeking out books and thinking about books that might slot into these different potential categories? Yes. I mean, I think luckily I can still read and enjoy the book for itself and be gripped by the book and love it purely as a reading experience but there is always a little part of my mind that's thinking oh this would be great for someone who is thinking about whether to have children or feeling really anxious because they haven't been outside for the last two years due to being in lockdown etc so there's always a little part of my brain that is thinking about the therapeutic possibilities of the book but I still really love reading for the sake of the book too. So I just always have my notebook handy to write down a couple of thoughts about the book as I go along. I've also got a document on my laptop where I can do hashtags like single parent or pet or whatever. So there's always a tiny part of me being the bibliotherapist, but probably 90% of me is being a reader loving the book until I think about it afterwards and then evaluate it. Well, as someone who's spent her life reading and thinking about reading and giving people suggestions for ways that they might read in a richer or more effective way, I thought it would be wonderful to give our listeners an opportunity to ask you some questions because as readers, sometimes we all get a little bit stuck. And so I put the question out there. I said, Ella Bertude is coming. Let's ask her some questions and see if she can solve our bookish problems. And I got some interesting responses. So let me ask you a few of those questions and we'll see if you can come up with some ideas for them. Adrianette04 messaged on Instagram to say, I can't get out of a book slump. I'm still reading, but nothing's really gripping me. What can I do? I would make a couple of suggestions. One would be to try reading aloud with a friend or partner, if you can. Because if you're in a bit of a reading slump and not finding it that fun and exciting, if you share it with someone else, then it can become a new way of reading and it could revitalize your love of reading. I'm always trying to persuade people that live together to try reading aloud together because it's just a lovely thing to do when you read aloud as a couple or as friends in a room. You are creating a bubble that the two of you are in, plus the author. 
And it's a very unique, magical moment. And you too will read that book in a unique way to you. So you'll always give it a slightly different cast to other people. And if you have a bit of a dramatic urge, then you can enjoy putting on the voices and being an interesting reader. So the reader is entertaining the listener and the listener is giving their attention to the reader. So it's very mutually generous as well. And if nothing else, you might find that the act of trying to read aloud together actually just makes you really impatient to read the book. So you might think, oh, well, that was fun, but now I want to go back and carry on reading the book by myself. That's happened to me quite often because me and my husband read aloud together a lot. And we have done since before we had kids, even before we were married. And sometimes you just really get into the book and want to read it quickly and uh, too impatient to sit there for the next six weeks every evening that you've got spare reading the book. But sometimes it's really lovely and we keep going and save it. So it depends if you're the type of person that's going to get into that idea, but give it a go. And then another thought is, I'd just like to recommend a book I have just read that was really gripping, which was Will Dean's The Last Passenger, which is a really gripping novel. Will Dean's written quite a few really good detective novels set in Scandinavia called Dark Pines, which I think were made into a TV series as well. And they feature a deaf detective woman, So they're really good. That's why I knew about him. And then this is his new book, The Last Passenger, which I just picked up really needing a gripping book because I was driving for about 10 hours and I knew I couldn't listen to something that literary that would require too much of my brain. So I put on The Last Passenger and was absolutely hooked. It's about a woman who goes on a cruise to America as a one-off once in a lifetime experience with her partner and then wakes up two days into the cruise and everyone's disappeared. There's no one on the boat. What the hell has happened? Why is she in that situation? And gradually she discovers a couple more people, but there should be 2,000. And they carry on going across the Atlantic because the cruise is being powered by a computer. Anyway, I won't tell you what happens, but it's just a great gripping read. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> I hadn't heard about that book at all. So yeah, now I'm quite interested. To read that. <laughs> yeah. I do think as you were talking as well, I think there's so much to be said for doing something that to you as a reader is quite unexpected. I love to read with my book club and have those conversations. I find them really enjoyable and life enhancing. But I had an away weekend with my book club this weekend and we had talked about the book on the Saturday and it was almost, hmm, what are we going to do on the Sunday? And because we'd been reading this book called Super Infinite, which is about the life and poetry of John Donne, I suggested let's have a think about poetry on the Sunday and everyone bring a poem. I said extra credit if you can recite it from memory, but just bring a poem that's meaningful to you and we'll read those out and have a little think about poetry. And I was completely flabbergasted by what an amazing conversation we had and the degree to which I felt like the world of poetry suddenly just opened up before me and that this incredibly wonderful, life-enhancing way of experiencing words and thoughts and feelings, I'd sort of, I, I feel like I've just been ignoring it all my life and suddenly had this complete like, oh my goodness. And also the way that then it was a great connector because we were my book club who I know very well but also my friend's parents who had been hosting us who I don't really know at all and are that bit older than us and they were able to join that conversation and share their own poetry and I just thought it was absolutely extraordinary the way that the experience that I had and I think the others did too just made me feel inspired and excited about this new avenue that I feel is just sitting there waiting for me now and it was that doing something different doing something that we never really do trying a topic that we don't really read so I think mixing it up is often really helpful. Yeah I totally agree and actually the group experience of reading and sharing thoughts about reading is quite rare these days it's something people tended to do in school and obviously in a book group you do it but that tends to be talking about the book for an hour, whereas what you're talking about is a whole weekend or an afternoon talking about poetry when you're all bringing your own experiences to the idea, which is really lovely. 
So I do always try and persuade people to come together in different ways of sharing books, whether it is reading aloud or getting together as a group and even just reading at the same time in the same space or being in a garden or being in a salon and just enjoying reading together. Mm. Right, let's move on to question two. Glorianne 1017 also on Instagram, has found recently that she only wants to read audiobooks and she's slightly fallen out of love with reading print. Any suggestions? Well, I don't see that as an ailment, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. Because <laughs> um, I'm actually a bit similar. I do wonder if it's something to do with, I don't know how old she is, Maybe being at a different stage of life, I think, when you want to be listening to audiobooks. For me, it's because I'm always multitasking and trying to do something domestic while listening to an audiobook or driving or I also paint. So when I'm painting, I'm listening to audiobooks. So for me, it totally works with my lifestyle. And I don't have that much time to just sit and read. It's also probably to do with my eyesight because I've always been short-sighted. I now have very vocal contact lenses and they're quite annoying for reading. So it's one of those practical things. I just love audiobooks and think, why not go with the flow and enjoy them? But I do also make myself read and sometimes you can't get the audiobooks and you've got to read it as a physical book. And I actually do love it when I finally do it. And I think I would recommend that Glorianne tries reading in a new place, try reading in a different part of the house, a different chair, maybe outside. If you've got a kind of swinging chair or nice rocking chair or something that you can take outside into the garden in this lovely weather or go up into a tree, find a tree house, try reading somewhere different, maybe on a boat, on a river take yourself somewhere because if you're not reading that much at all then it's worth making a bit of an effort to go and read somewhere interesting even just reading on a blanket in a park and you'll probably find it's such a lovely experience that you want to carry on Mm. our pod regular guest and dear friend phil chafee asks should i finish a book i'm not enjoying no Mm. (laughs) i am a big fan and me and susan wrote about it in the novel cure of giving yourself a 50 page rule so if you don't love a book within 50 pages then put it to one side and then don't discard it give yourself the possibility of reading it later so with books that I've tried that I know I ought to read but I'm really not getting into I put it in a special place on my shelf to come back to And I have found there's been quite a few books that I've initially not liked, not gone on with, couldn't really get into, put them aside and then came back six months later and loved. So I think I'd never say never, especially if it is a book that people have urged you to read, put it to one side and then come back to it. But don't make yourself read it. Don't push yourself through unless it's a life and death necessity to read it for work or something like that but generally I just don't think it's worth the pain but you're almost bound to be able to come back to it and like it another time what do you think do you push through well I was thinking I generally do finish things but I I I just don't know whether I should confess it I don't in any way feel obliged to read every word or even every paragraph And if I get to a point in a book where I feel like, oh, no, this is not for me, I just let my eyes slide through the remaining pages. I will read it, but I won't read it with that kind of, the way that you read something you're really enjoying, where you really almost purposefully read slowly and you savour every sentence because that's so much the pleasure of the experience of reading it. I think that's what I do with books that I don't enjoy. And I think you should too, Phil. I'm shocked at the idea. (laughs) that you don't finish well he's asking I mean maybe he does and actually he feels like am I doing the wrong thing well I think the other thing to mention as well to Phil is if he's reading a book that he's not really enjoying then try reading it in a different way so try it on audio and you might suddenly find that you love it on audio or try reading it aloud 
give yourself another option. It doesn't have to be that you just read it. Even try taking it out into a cafe or park and reading it somewhere else. You can always give it another go. But I also think you don't have to finish it. I mean, there are a lot of books in the world, aren't there? And uh, we're yeah. going to come on to that, actually, I yeah. think, with some of our subsequent problems. ISNVN 2013, isn't the, <laughs> says that her problem is that she feels she has too many books to read. Do you have that feeling? And if so, what do you do? Yes, I do always feel like there are too many books to read. And my answer is to get a bibliotherapist who can guide you with what to read next. That would be one option. Find a way through the forest of books with a guide, whether it's a bibliotherapist or whether you sit down with a notebook and think, okay, what are the books I really want to read over the next few years? And then go through it methodically. Because it is very easy to go into a bookshop or library and think, ah, there's too many millions of books, so many amazing ones, so many classics. So many brilliant new books just been published that I must read. And it is overwhelming. But I think you can find a way through with a bit of help. So either talk to a bibliotherapist or be your own bibliotherapist, you could say, by thinking about what are your priorities? What are the most important things to you? Do you want to read fresh new modern voices do you want to read diverse voices do you want to read classics and then just write a list of the next 10 books to read and then stick to that yeah I was thinking for me it's often those conversations with people about books and people's recommendations or they'll tell you a book that they read that they didn't get on with and that's really helpful yeah, it's just true. almost knowing, you know, oh, great. I, yeah, that one doesn't sound like it's for me either. So I, I, great. I don't have to worry about that one. And then that frees you up to look for the book that you think you really would enjoy. But I constantly think this. None of us will ever be able to read even the tiniest fraction of all the books that are out there. No one will. And so to me, then, these conversations about books and swapping notes and just keeping an eye on what people are saying about books and comparing and contrasting different people's reading experiences is really helpful. And that conversation, in a way, is much more accessible. I think it's going on online, it's going on on Bookstagram, it's going on on YouTube. You can listen to podcasts where people are having those discussions like ours, but, you know, happily there are many others out there. And it just gives you that little opportunity to hear about a range of books And I suppose maximize your chances, I think, of finding those ones that are the ones that are really going to speak to you or be meaningful to you, which is what I think it's all about. Mm. I could also add that it really helps if you have a reading notebook. Whenever you finish reading a book, you write down in your reading notebook what you thought about it. So you note the title of the book, the author the date you finished reading it, the place you were when you read it, because that really jogs your memory about how you felt about the book, and then a few thoughts about the book. And that really helps you focus on the book you've just read, but it also helps you think about what you loved about the book and therefore what you might want to read next. And you can also, in the back of your notebook, write down the books you've been recommended by other people. So you've always got a physical list of those books some people obviously do it online or on computers I'm a big fan of doing it with a pen on paper in a notebook because it helps you pinpoint your ideas more concretely I feel and it's more of a tangible aid to memory whereas what you do online or on the computer your brain doesn't quite believe in in the same way Interesting. Yeah, I'm looking slightly shamefaced because I bought with much enthusiasm and delight this beautiful moleskin reader's journal Mm, when I was out visiting Laura in Vancouver. I came across it in the shop. I was like, oh, yes, this is brilliant. I love this so much. It was organized with little tabs according to alphabetical. So then brilliant. You know, you can go back and look for your books that way. And I like that. I like that it kind of came preloaded with this nice structure and everything about it I was (laughs) so excited about. And I managed to write three very conscientious. Yes, I read this book here and it's recommended to me by so-and-so and this is what I thought about it. And here's how many stars I would give it. And I haven't managed to write any others. And I feel so bad about it because I'm just like, why can't I do this thing? I think I know why is because it feels like work to me. 
you know, when I finish a book, I just want to move on to the next one and have a nice time reading that. I don't want to have to go back and do what feels to me like a bit of work, admin, capturing my thoughts about it. Yeah, I totally relate. I have to force myself to do it. Do myself. you? Do I yeah. just, should I just work a bit harder to force myself to do it? Just a bit of self-discipline Maybe. wouldn't kill me, would it? Because it is lovely to have that mm. record. Mm. And if you think about it in five years' time, you want to look back and have that record of what you read in 2023. Yeah. And it's really nice also to show other people and say, oh, look, these are all the books that I read that year and so on. So it is really useful. You're re-inspiring me about it. <laughs> all right. So I've got a couple of slightly more specific ones that came, which are not so particularly related to books more generally. One issue came from an unnamed listener that she's having murderous thoughts towards her brother-in-law. I think more than anything that might offer practical tips in this regard, she's more looking for something to help her come to terms with her very, obviously, ruffled feelings about this individual. What would you suggest? Well, funnily enough, in the novel Cure, we do have an ailment title, which is Murderous Thoughts. <gasps> and the cure for that is Therese Racan by Emile Zola. And that is an amazing book, which very much puts you off the idea of committing a murder. If our friend was thinking of taking it in any literal sense, but also it's an amazing read. And in this book, there is a murder. There's a married couple who have a really miserable time living in Paris. And it's very much gone into great detail of how awful their life is. And then the female in the couple starts an affair with another man and they jointly decide to murder her husband. This is not giving it away too much, but the murder does take place. And it's horrible. I mean, it is pretty grim. And then you see for the rest of the book, the results of that. And it's very much a book that shows you that murder does not pay and things are going to come back to haunt you. But it's kind of a very dark funny book at the same time so I think it is very cathartic to our friends who's having the murderous thoughts because it will make them feel like they go through the experience <laughs> of <laughs> how it might feel to take something out on someone you're finding really infuriating but then the results of that and how bad that is so I think it's a really good cure for that issue and another quite specific one. What about something for someone who was in an outwardly successful career, but feeling like they were maybe a bit stuck in a rut? I've got a couple of good cures for that. One, I think, is Miss Benson's Beetle by Rachel Joyce, which is a really lovely book about a woman who is stuck in a boring job which is outwardly successful. She's a teacher in a nice girls' school. But it's in the 1950s, and she's sort of on the shelf and feels frustrated. And she suddenly decides she's had enough and goes off to fulfil her dream, which she's had since she was a child, to find this golden beetle that she discovered in a book when she was 11. And that beetle is on the other side of the world, beyond Australia. I think it's beyond New Zealand. And off she goes in a boat to discover it. So she throws her job up in the air, follows her dream and has an amazing time and starts a whole new life as a result. And I think it's a very, again, a very cathartic read because it would show our dissatisfied friend who feels like she's in an annoying job, although it looks outwardly successful, that she could throw it all to the winds and go on this amazing adventure and fulfill a dream. Maybe just reading about it cathartically might do the trick because she might not actually really want to throw everything out the window and go off on a massive adventure. There's another one which I've got in the Fiction Prescriptions pack, which is called The Dream Job by Kirsten Modlin, which is a really good read about someone being sold what seems to be a dream job. And actually, it turns out to be nothing but. And it might be quite a fun read for this dissatisfied person as well, because it kind of shows you that no job is really a dream job. And maybe her job that she feels is a bit annoying is actually great. And she might not be able to find anything more perfect. So two sides of the coin. One would show her she's probably better off where she is. And then the other book would show her 
maybe she does want to throw it all up in the air and go off and follow her dream. I can't resist taking advantage of having you here to ask one, which is one of my own personal ones, which is after reading Cormac McCarthy's The Road and various other apocalypse novels over the years, I actually am increasingly haunted by this sense of dread about the end of the world. Do you have any advice for this? Is there anything I could read that would almost offset those? I can relate to that because I think it's quite a common concern and Mm. actually reading all those really depressing dystopian novels can make you feel very concerned about the future. Have you read, you probably have read Station Eleven. I didn't for that very reason. I thought I can't read another book about the end of the world. (laughs) Well, actually, that is one with heart and hope that I found heartening. So although it is a dystopian scenario where... 90% of the population of the world dies. Mm. So that is depressing. You don't see any horror. It's not a grim book like The Road is. And also it's got this really lovely, positive future. So although there's lots of sadness and lots of people have been lost, you have this Shakespearean troupe of actors going around Canada, taking Shakespeare to anyone that's willing to listen. And they bring the joys of art and poetry to the people that are left. And they slowly do start a new positive community, which is post-technology, because all the technology has died as well, and they have the little museum case with iPhones in it, because they obviously can't use the iPhones. So it's quite funny seeing what the world is like after the world of the internet. But it actually becomes quite a loving community. So that's one book I would say is a good dystopian post-apocalyptic read. And another one that I think is great is Richard Power's The Overstory, which is big, epic, and does have aspects of dystopian sadness, but it's really about the power of trees, how important trees are, and how we can help save the trees and although it does have quite a lot of real tragedy in it in terms of giant redwood trees being cut down and people protesting for it and coming to grief themselves there's also I think a message of positivity and hope within the story and it's also got these incredibly beautiful descriptions of the tree canopies of the redwoods which make you really want to go and stop trees being destroyed i think it's quite a gentle and beautiful read i think it would make you be more positive about the future i like richard powers i've read a couple by him but i haven't read that one mainly because it's quite long and i think i felt a bit daunted by that and also because i understood that the structure was a bit like the branches of a tree and even that made me think oh my goodness yeah this sounds like a lot but i know that he's an incredibly readable engaging writer yeah. So maybe this is the nudge I need to finally pick it up. The Tree Book, as I think of it. The Overstory is The Tree Book. And Merlin Sheldrake's Entangled Life is The Mushroom Book. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and where do you get your book recommendations? What's your radar for books? Quite a few different sources. Podcasts, like yours. And Thanks very much. radio for podcasts about books as well, such as A Good Read. Mm. Love those because they always have quite obscure books quite often that you wouldn't have thought of reading. Clients. So every time I have a bibliotherapy session, someone will say, oh, have you read this? And I haven't obviously read everything in the world, Mm. much though I try. No one can. (laughs) So there's often books that I read because a client has said, oh, this is an amazing book, changed my life, you've got to read it. I'm noting them down during the session. So it can be very much a two-way event as well newspaper reviews and also fellow bibliotherapists there's two other bibliotherapists in our school of life gang susan elderkin and simona lyons and we recommend books to each other all the time as well well ella i can't imagine any greater pleasure than having you sitting here in my kitchen recommending books to me i love the little tagline on the box of fiction prescriptions which says possible side effects include improved well-being broader horizons and a voracious appetite for reading which is what i think we all have and want to continue to have so thank you so much for joining me thank you it's been really lovely to be here and share our love of books 
that's nearly it for this episode. Books mentioned were Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne, The Last Passenger by Will Dean, Therese Raquin by Emile Zola, Miss Benson's Beetle by Rachel Joyce, The Dream Job by Kirsten Modulin, Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, and The Overstory by Richard Powers. And if you want more from the source, do seek out The Novel Cure, co-written with Susan Elderkin, and Ella's books, The Art of Mindful Reading, and Fiction Prescriptions. If you want to find out more about Ella's bibliotherapy sessions, or any other aspect of her work, the link to her website, ellabertu.com, is in the show notes. This episode of the Book Club Review was edited and produced by me, Kate Slotover. If you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, do follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or get in touch direct at the Book Club Review at gmail.com. And if you enjoy our shows and want to do a nice thing in return, please do leave us a quick star rating and review. Wondering how to do that? Check the show notes where you'll find a handy how-to guide. But for now, thanks for listening and happy book clubbing. <laughs>